Hi, everyone. So I am Sunil Marti, and this is Jose Luis Contreras. He'll be my co-speaker today. And uh, today, we'll be talking about satellite image classification for land use. So how many of you here have to deal with satellite images or have a use case, something like that? OK, this is one and two. OK. So the agenda today is we'll have a brief introduction of the data set and uh, the image description. And uh, satellite images, yeah, you have cloud covers. So how do you uh, classify cloud cover images? And segmentation, we'll be talking about semantic segmentation here. And the whole thing, once you train your models, the whole thing would be put in a streaming pipeline. And we had used Apache Beam for that, a small demo and future work coming up. So the goal here is to identify tulip fields from Sentinel-2 satellite images. So this is an example. If you look at this image here, yeah, this may be a tulip field, and this may be a tulip field, this band here. So that's what you're trying to identify from satellite images. So this is the typical workflow. Uh, basically, you download your images, you filter it for cloud, you filter out the images that have cloud cover, and then you segment your images for tulip fields. OK, so before we go into the detailed slide deck, let me just run through a quick notebook here. Uh, yeah. So uh, let me run through this notebook. So now we'll be doing the data acquisition. And uh, wherein we are actually downloading the satellite images, Sentinel-2 from Sentinel-2 satellite. And uh, we have something called a web mapping service. That's what WMS is for the Sentinel-2 images. We'll be downloading the data using the web mapping service instance. And uh, so let's do that. Once we do that, we overlay the images with the tulip fields, what the tulip fields are. So, uh, so we are using a package called IPyLeaflet for overlaying the image with the different layers. So let's look at the interactive display. So for this particular demo, we're actually taking a map of Den Helder in Netherlands, a political map, and overlaying that with a satellite image. So this is Den Helder in Netherlands. OK, so this is the political map. Now, we don't know what is here in this area and this area. So that's what we get from the satellite images. So this satellite image, it's coming from the uh, web mapping service for Sentinel-2. So let's add the layer. So once you overlay your map, political map, with a satellite image, this is how it looks. And what we are trying to do here is to identify the tulip beds, which are across this image. So let's do that. In order to do that, we need some ground truth as to what the image is and where the tulip beds are. And that data is coming from uh, Synergize or from Geopedia. So yeah, this is what you would see as output. So that's where the tulip beds are. So that's the goal of this uh, presentation today, how to identify the tulip beds from satellite images. Let me go back to the slide deck. OK, so from here, Jose will talk, to, talk, talk us through the process for doing this. Watch out. Hello, hello. Yeah. Can you? So first of all, the kind of data we are getting, the satellite images, are coming from Sentinel-2, which is a satellite mission from the European Space Agency. And it has two satellites, which revisit each, each region each five days. The data is coming from 13 spectral bands, ranging from RGB to up to the shortwave infrared. But we will only be using RGB here for different reasons we can cover later. The spatial resolution for these images is 10 meters per pixel for the RGB bands. For the other bands, some of them have 20 meters per pixel, some of them 60 meters per pixel. And they follow a free and open data policy, which makes it pretty convenient for us. Uh, give me an example, please. OK. So to download the images, we use a tool which is very similar to the one Sunil just showed you. It was developed by Mathieu. And basically, what you have to do, you select your polygon, and it downloads for you the different tiles with all the satellite images. 
This data is in RGB, as I mentioned before. And the images we are downloading are chips of, 20, uh, of 256 by 256. As you can see here, we mo many times have traveled with cloudy images. This image is nice, but the other one is super cloudy. So that's a problem we have to solve. Go ahead. That's a problem we have to solve because otherwise there's not much segmentation we can do if all we can see is clouds. So how do we filter these clouds? We are gonna we are gonna train a neural network to filter images as clear or cloudy. And for that we are gonna use ResNet 50 and ResNet 101. Um, why these networks? Because they are one of the best networks for computer vision problems. And also we found out, well, we didn't find out, there is, an art, there is some articles that they tend to transfer learning better, which will be useful in this case as we will see later. So this is the basic building block of our ResNet. And here the most interesting part maybe is this connection here, which is a, an identity mapping, which basically will, it allows ResNets to be deeper than other networks. So you can have ResNet 50, which is 50 layers, ResNet 101 with 100 layers, and even deeper networks. So one problem, as always, with neural networks is how to find training data for this network. Because we could label data manually from our data source, but it would be pretty time consuming. So we found this data set in Kaggle, which is coming from this planet, uh, understanding the Amazon from space competition. And it contains 40,000 images, which are labeled as clear, like this one, hazy, partly cloudy, or completely cloudy. So apart from that data, we also took 5,000 images from Sentinel-2, downloaded with our tool, and, and we had to hand label them. There was no other approach. So from these images, we have like 50% of them which are cloudy. And from the Kaggle competitions, we have like 30% of them are cloudy. Um, I told you before that there are four classes in the Kaggle competition, but here we will only consider to clear and cloudy. And the cloudy class englobes all the three other classes like haze, partly cloudy and cloudy. We will consider them all as cloudy. Because basically if we have any kind of clouds in the image, it could be disturbing for our segmentation network, so we prefer to filter them out. So this is how we are gonna distribute our data. We first of all have the Kaggle, that the Kaggle dataset, out of which we use three quarters of it to train the ResNets, and we save the final quarter for validation and choosing a model. And then from the 5,000 extra images we have, we use again 75% of them to fine tune the network we chose, and the last 25% to test the system and evaluate the accuracy. So these are the results we got. As you can see, both ResNet 50 and ResNet 101 are pretty similar in terms of performance. What you can see here on the right, the epochs, is the, um, the number of training epochs we, we had to convey for each of them. And as ResNet 50 is a bit simpler, it takes less time to converge. So instead of 40 epochs, we only had to train it for 20. And the second number you see there is the number of epochs on the fine-tuning data set we ran them on. So given that we have almost the same accuracy, but it's a bit better for ResNet 50, plus it's simpler and it takes less, less time to train, it makes sense to choose ResNet 50. This is just an example of the results. These are, <laughs> as you can guess, these are the cloudy images, uh, the clear images, sorry. <laughs> and the other ones are the cloudy. So the thing is, after this whole process of filtering out the clouds, we don't have that much data. We have like 5,000 images, maybe, because there are many clouds in the Netherlands. So we need to do some data augmentation to have more data for our segmentation network, which we will see later. So for this, we use Augmentor, which is this Python library, which I highly recommend. As you can see, it's super easy. You define a pipeline, you define a couple of operations, and then you can get your augmented images. The transformations we chose are skew, share, then flips and rotations. So we can see them in the next slide. Here, on the, here you have the original image, 
and that's the result of applying some random transformations to it. It should, should some changes in perspective, some rotations, but we can still identify the tulip fields from it. So now on to the segmentation part, which is where we will identify the tulip fields. So this is an example of the expected outcome of the segmentation. On the left, you have the, the image with the tulip fields, which are pretty identifiable only in red. And what we expect to get are the polygons defining the bounding boxes of these tulip fields. So how do we do this? We use a unit, which is a state-of-the-art CNN for segmentation. It's gotten like the best results in most competitions and in most applications where it has been used. It was originally designed for biomedical images, but we found that it works pretty well for this too. And um, yeah, you can see the paper is pretty interesting. This is the architecture of the network, which has a contracting part here, in which we get smaller, smaller layers each time, but with a higher number of features. And then we have an expanding part on the other side, which is here, and in which we upsample and also, the most interesting part is these skip connections here, which map directly information from the first layers to the last ones. So that way we kind of keep some spatial information in the end of the network. Then now we have, yeah, we have two slides about the implementation of the building blocks. The most interesting part to see is the convolutional block, which is the basic block, which contains a convolution, a batch normalization, and the uh, ReLU activation. And then we have the down block, and in the next slide, the up block, in case you are interested. Uh, next one, because we don't have that much time. Okay, so for the training data of this unit, we are using the satellite images we have, but we also need ground truth, right? So the ground truth is coming from Geopedia, from Synergize, like Sunil showed you before. And it comes in the form of these images right here where we have the white polygons uh, representing the tulip fields, and the rest of it is black. So, um, I will talk before about... No, uh, two ahead. One more? Perfect. Yeah, instead of starting by the loss function, let's start with the evaluation metric, which we used intersection over union. It's probably the most used metric for segmentation tasks. And as you can see, it's basically the ratio between the intersection of what you predicted to be tulip fields in this case, and the union of what you predicted to be tulip fields and the, um, the ground truth. It's also called the Jacquard index. And it's pretty similar to the dice coefficient, which is the function we will be using as loss, which is this one here. So this one is the soft dice coefficient loss. It's similar to, the dice coefficient is similar to intersection over union, but it measures kind of, if you use it on a whole data set, it measures something more similar to the average performance instead of the worst case performance, which would be the intersection over union somehow. So that's why we chose it. And some interesting things we can have here. Prediction, which we have there, has the, um, the form of a probability. That's why we call it soft dice coefficient instead of the regular one. And it's the soft max output of the unit we have before. And yeah, well, we have an, a minus because we need to make it a loss function. So the results we got on this, we got an intersection over union score of 0 0.73 after training for 20 epochs. So, to put this in context, normally intersection over union, you consider 0 0.5 to be, well, it was considered to be a good result. Right now, 0 0.6 is considered to be like the standard good result. And to compare our results with some other state-of-the-art results, we found the most similar thing we found is this DSTL Kaggle competition, which was also satellite image segmentation. And the best result there was getting 0 0.84 intersection over union. But the difference here is that they were segmenting crops versus buildings or water or different things. In our case, we are segmenting tulip fields from any other kind of thing, which can also be crops. So it's difficult to compare the results, but 
Yeah, that's what we have. Now, Sunil will okay. Thank you. continue. Yeah, so once you have trained your uh, deep learning models, the ResNet and UNet, so obviously you want to deploy them in production and uh, you want to go in for streaming in France. And uh, most deep learning frameworks that we have today are Python based for whatever reason. Uh, I wish it was JVM based. So uh, how do you put this in a streaming pipeline? And uh, obviously one approach was to maybe make a RPC call from a Flink, Flink pipeline to a Python model. Yeah, sure, you can do that. It's, do it's doable. Uh, the other approach was to go with uh, Google Beam, uh, to go with Apache Beam, which has a Python SDK and a Java SDK. So what is Apache Beam? It's an agnostic unified batch and streaming programming model, as many of you know. It's got support for uh, Java, Python, and Go SDKs. And yeah, it's got several backend runners for Flink, Spark, and Google Dataflow, and a local data runner. So why Apache Beam? <coughs> Excuse me. Why Apache Beam? So number one, it's port portable. Portable in the sense that you're writing your code against the Beam API, and you can run it on a Flink or a Spark executor, or any other executor that's supported by Beam. And uh, the second reason is it's got a unified batch and streaming API. And the third reason is Ervid Bar model SDK. It's got extensible model and uh, SDKs. So you can use a custom SDK to write your uh, custom syncs and sources. So the Apache Beam vision has been that, again, Apache Beam is a project from Google that's been open sourced into Apache. And the vision is you have a different categories of users. If you look, this is the architecture of a Beam. You have a Beam, Java, uh, Python, and other languages. Now they have Go as of uh, last week, I believe, or maybe last month. So the end users create pipelines in a familiar language. It could be Java or Python. And then you have a different category of users, like SDK writers, the folks who write, uh, who want to, <clears throat> who want to create new language packs or new language support for Beam. So the cons, uh, we can make that available for different languages here. And the most important part is the runners, the backend runners. So today we have Flink, Spark, Dataflow, and Apex. So you could have a different uh, streaming engine as a runner for this. So if you look at the Beam programming API, if I write my code in Java, Beam API, using the Java Beam API, you create your pipeline using Java Beam API. And then you specify your runner. You want to run it on Flink or Spark, or, or do you want to run it locally? And if you look at the Beam API, they have something called FN, or function runners. And these function runners are defined in the high-level language. And they are, uh, that's, that's your logical language. And they're translated for each of the specific runners, Flink or Spark, and executed on those frameworks. So overall, for this project, this is your inference pipeline. So Jose trains the models. Jose trains the ResNet model and the UNet model. And how do you plug that into a streaming pipeline? So this, you ingest your satellite image data. You call the ResNet 50 for cloud classification. And you call UNet for segmentation. All of that is one beam call. And we are running it on the Flink executor. Any questions so far? So this is, for this particular code, this is how the Beam inference pipeline looks like. You specify your pipeline options, which could be your input, output, the model folder. And uh, this is the typical Beam API with Beam pipeline, SP. You read the images first. And then I'm creating a window of all the images. So I kind of create a mini batch for inference. And then you filter out the cloudy images. And once you have the filtered images, you take the filtered images and segment them for uh, unit classification. So this is a typical Beam pipeline. So uh, obviously, if you look at this flow again, uh, yeah, each of this is a Beam function. Each of these uh, steps here is a Beam function. And let's look at the snippet, code snippets for these. So this is for uh, Cloud Classifier. And uh, Doofin is uh, it's a Beam convention. Every function is a Doofin. And you specify that as a part of a Pardo, which is, again, the Beam API. Uh, so for you're filtering out the cloudy, fun uh, this is filtering out the cloudy images. So I'm loading, uh, I'm loading my ResNet here as part of the initialization process. And then I have, once I have the ResNet image, I'm calling, uh, yeah, I'm calling the making the predictions here for the ResNet image, for the ResNet images against the ResNet model. And, uh, and that's you go, that you go. And I get a collection of all the clear images, the ones that are not cloudy. 
So the next step of once you have your clear images, the next step, as Jose explained, was to segment those images for tulip fields. So this is the Beam API for that. So you have your clear, clear images, which is a collection of file names. And then, uh, then you create a mask, the mask image. And then you save that as your output. So uh, let's do a quick demo. So here. OK, so the one challenge that we had when building this was Beam API supports only Python 2.7 as of today. Okay, it's not on Python 3.8. They're working on it, nevertheless. And uh, yeah, so the, some of the code was written in Python 3 and Python 2.7 and Python 3. And me not being a Python programmer, it was kind of like a living hell for some time trying to get this working. And uh, the other challenge was the Flink runner for Beam's Python SDK is still experimental. And uh, thanks to the Google folks, they really got it to work in some shape for this talk. Uh, hats off to them. So let's. this is on Python 2 now. So let me run this. So it's going to take some time. It takes some time to start up and load, load the deep learning models. So while that's running, uh, While that's running, let's talk about some uh, important links. So most of the satellite image data is available on AWS at AWS Earth. And uh, you can get the, uh, uh, you have data sets from the Sentinel-2, from Landsat, and the different satellites here, both in infrared band and the far ex near infrared, as well as in RGB format. And uh, to understand better what unit is and how semantic segmentation works, there's a very interesting medium.com post by this gentleman. It's really interesting. And he explains very well how unit works. And of course, the papers on ResNet and UNet that you could look at. Yeah, and of course, the Beam APIs and uh, this light deck here. So let's go back and see how our. So this is going to take some time. Uh, so let's. How are we on time? What's the time? I just take my watch. So, okay, no problem. OK, so this is going to take some time. And uh, yeah, this is something I was, uh, I was kind of like, maybe I should just put some German messages and you know, translate them in English using a neural machine translation model while this was running. Uh, sure. OK, so let's uh, let that keep running. But uh, this is a sample output that you would see. So here you have this satellite image. Do you see any tulip fields here? Or, uh, Nothing. So the output of that would be a blank, a black screen. Okay. So let's look at the next image. Yeah. Do you see any tulip fields here? Yeah. There is something here, and something here and here. So that's the, that's the output that you get. So using a unit segmentation. So that's where it kind of identifies the where the tulip fields are. And again, let me remind you, we are only using three channels, the RGB channels. We are not using the near infrared and you know, further uh, bands, which would provide much more information. Now, the last sample here. So this is, seems to be a small tulip field. And uh, so that's the output of that. But uh, do you really think it's a tulip field? It doesn't look like one to me. It's a house, yeah. It's, it's a building. And uh, the reason, again, for that is because we are only using the small RGB, three channels, three bands. If we had been using more uh, infrared band, then maybe we would have had more information that we could go against. So uh, yeah, it's still running. OK, give it some time. So given this image, which kind of, you know, brings, brings as a, which kind of serves as a segue to what the future work could be. So classify rock formations. So we are only using the RGB bands, but if you're using the short, uh, short wave infrared images, which are kind of in the 2.1 to 2.2 nanometer range, all, let me again remind you, the images that we have are in the 10 meter range resolution. If we can go with further resolution, like 2.1 to 2.2 nanometers, we can actually classify rock formations. Well, we all know that plants don't grow on rocks, so that's a data point that we could use, leverage. And uh, also, all the objects, rocks, they emit radiant flux. It's called the amount of energy that they radiate out per unit time, which is, uh, given, which is known as radiant flux. And that's the equation for that. 
we could use that as information to classify whether this is a rock or a building or it's a crop field. The other, the other uh, future uh, use case would be, how do you measure crop health? So for this, you can actually go with the near infrared radiation images. So plants obviously have chlorophyll and mesophyll and other uh, pigments. And each of those, they give out, uh, you know, they give out some radiations, infrared radiations. And uh, the amount of chlorophyll content differs between the plants as well as in the various growth stages of the same plant. So depending on the infrared radiation that you get from the plants, we can determine the health of the plant as well as classify this plant as uh, tulip fields versus a rose bed. And of course, the very last use case is just go with the uh, red band. So have you ever f wondered, like, uh, if you look at an image, if you look at any satellite image, without there being a clear, clear demarcation of the boundaries between the countries or uh, the different regions, yet just by a visual, looking at it visually, you are still able to figure out, you know, this is this could be this is uh, Netherlands and this is Germany and this is where Germany starts and Netherlands stops. Uh, this is uh, Amsterdam versus Berlin. Have you ever figured out why you were able to do that, even though you're just looking at a infrared, uh, just a plain image? It's because most of the images are in red band, which is more uh, visually appealing to humans. And it's kind of like a so clustering. What you're doing is a clustering. Oh, this, this particular region is uh, Amsterdam versus this is Berlin. So yeah, that's uh, definitely a possibility going forward. OK, great, I have this running. So this is the beam that's running, okay, beam API. So if you look at this, these are the different transformations that are happening. And uh, yeah, that it's reading about, uh, I'm reading about 10 images and you know, calculating the mask for those 10 images. Okay, cool. Uh, so we are done with that. Let me switch to show you the outputs. Let's look at this guy. It's hard, man. <laughs> so this one, uh, do we see any tulip fields here? Yeah, I see some reds there. But uh, is that tulip fields? Maybe not. Let's look at the mask for this. You have to hold it to my mouth. <laughs> This is the mask for that. This yeah. is the mask for the image you saw before. Wow, nice. It's a nice black screen, which means there's no, there's no tulips here. Yep. So it's a nice black screen, which means there's no tulips there. So let's try a different one. Uh, so that, yeah, there, is, there seems to have a tulip bed there. Let's try a different one. Maybe not. No. Okay, let's go with this. So this is another sample image. So it's got something here. Could that be tulip beds? Yeah, maybe. So let's look at the mask. This is your original image, and uh, this is the mask. So the original image had some tulips here and uh, here. And uh, there's something here, yellow band. So this is what the mask came up with, which means, yeah, those are possible tulip fields. 
Okay, so this is uh, kind of an example of, you know, uh, this is all running in a beam streaming pipeline. So you can have, you can actually get the images live from satellite and you have your trained models. You put your trained models in a streaming pipeline and you can make your inference this way. So yeah, this code is running on a Flink runner, by the way, on a Beam's, uh, Beam Python SDK Flink runner. Let me emphasize that. It's still ex experimental, but nevertheless, it's working in some shape. Okay, switching back to PowerPoint. Okay, so we talked about this. So uh, that kind of concludes this talk. And uh, some of the credits for this, Jose, of course, and uh, Kellen and Matthew from Amazon Berlin here, who worked on this. Ali Abbas from uh, Frankfurt. He was the guy who came up, came up with some of the ideas that we had used here. And uh, he's an expert on computer vision and land use classification. And of course, the Apache Beam folks from Google, they have been very helpful to get this uh, Python SDK runner for Flink in some shape working. And uh, of course, a few other folks from Amazon here, Pascal and Jet Sandoval. Jet Sandoval is the guy from Amazon who maintains the, uh, who maintains the data set on AWS, the one I had pointed to earlier. So Earth on AWS is maintained by Jet Sandoval. And uh, of course, a few of the open NLP folks and, and uh, others who have been helping out with this uh, slide deck, at least for reviewing the slide deck. So with that concludes our talk. Any questions? Uh, hi, uh, thanks for the talk. So I'm just curious, do um, roofs cause a lot of problems for detecting tul tulip fields? Hello? Uh, uh, whether roofs, uh, just of, out of curiosity, roofs of houses is yeah. a kind of a square which is more or less red. So, uh, so like the example I showed you. Uh, take it. Sure, they definitely do. And uh, the reason for that is uh, we are only using, uh, so for example, this one. The uh, reason for that is we are only using three bands, red, green, blue. Whereas if you have been taking more infrared bands and additional bands, you would be getting better resolutions. For example, this one. This is not a tulip field. It's a house. It's a building. And it's a roof of the building. So it's kind of you know, classifying that as a tulip field because it's red in color. Yep. Thanks for the talk. Uh, my question is, how long does it take to tra train the unit um, and which hardware did you use to train it? Mm, we were using an NVIDIA Titan V. Um, it didn't take too long. It took like nine hours to train it for 50 epochs, and then we chose the best performing epoch, which was after 23. So, so yeah, you could train it in eight hours, more or less. So also one other thing, for well, training the deep learning models, what we had seen is you train four different deep learning models with the different hyperparameters, and you get those models, average them out, train the fifth model with averaged values. That works the best, OK? It works the best. That's it. <laughs> so it's kind of like an ensemble training. Hi, thanks. So just to follow up on that point, Sunil, if you're, you're saying you run four models and get an ensemble of them here. Hi, it's Jim here. Um, so, um, you know, my intuition for hyperparameter search is that you would run many experiments, maybe grid search or, and, you know, nowadays people are doing model architecture search. And <clears throat> would you have benefited from a farm of GPUs? where you could do uh, large-scale search before you then start your eight hours of training? Yeah, definitely, you... yeah. And uh, I totally agree with you, Jim, and uh, you're right. And uh, one other point that we did not mention here was uh, the number of epochs we had chosen for uh, the training the models. So we kind of tried with uh, different epochs, number of epochs, and we kind of plotted the graph and the, uh, uh, the accuracy of the different one, and we just went with 23, for example, for ResNet. Yeah, so we kind of found that 23 is where the elbow happens in the graph and you plot the graph versus the accuracy, uh, number of epochs versus the accuracy. And similarly for 43 with the ResNet 101. Since the accuracy was about the same, we just went with ResNet 50, it's a smaller model compared to 101. And uh, similarly for uh, UNET, uh, we didn't have it, yeah. UNET, I think we went with uh, 25, 23, uh, 23 epochs again. Yeah, definitely. To, to your question, Jim, yeah, definitely should have benefited with a GPU cluster. Yeah. So this most of this stuff was trained on a single GPU instance, Titan. Yeah. 
you feel? Any other questions? No more questions? I'm, I'm just curious, um, for, the, for the recognition of tulips, it, it looks like it, it's a lot based on color. Um, did, did you ever try to, to build a model that just looks using OpenCV and look, looking basically using statistical um, approaches for, for yeah. image or object detection? Yeah, no, we did not, but yeah, that's one approach to definitely consider. Um, well, the idea for this, uh, the idea behind this whole project was to actually use deep learning to, uh, from the word go. And so we. Okay, well, thank you everyone for coming and thanks to our presenters here. And we're going to make a short break. <laughs>